Okay, hello everyone. Um, so today we're gonna talk a little bit about loops. I've been doing a lot of work on um, loop fusion and uh, recently a few members of my team have started uh, looking at loop distribution in LLVM. So this is a follow-on talk to a talk I gave last fall at the developers conference in San Jose where I went through um, the loop fusion work that I had been doing with Johannes. Um, Hal Finkel and Michael Cruz were also contributing to that. And so, like I said, this is the follow-on talk where I'm going to give an update in terms of where that work is, and then, and then we'll talk a little bit about loop distribution and some of the direction that we're going. So, uh, agenda for today. So, again, a uh, quick update on, um, on the status of the Loop Fusion patch that's, that's available, um, and then some of the work that we are doing recently to extend Loop Fusion. And then we'll shift gears a little bit and talk about loop distribution and some of the, some of the direction that we're going there. It's, it's very early days for the work that we're doing for loop distribution, so it's, it's very much work in progress. But I wanted to mention it here to try and get feedback if anybody's got ideas or suggestions on, on the direction that we're, that we're looking at going. Okay, so a very quick overview uh, or recap. This is, I think, the only slide that I've got from my, from my previous talk. Um, just a, a quick overview of what Loop Fusion is. So it, the idea is fairly simple. You want to take two loops and combine them into a single loop or loop nest. Um, there's several different motivations for wanting to do this. From a, from a performance point of view, you can get um, increased data reuse. Uh, you can get parallelism do things like minimizing bandwidth on your machine, that sort of thing. Uh, you, you also do fusion for um, basically as a way to enhance or, uh, the scope for other loop optimizations. So if you have uh, a lot of the loop optimizations that just work on a single loop nest, the more or the more statements you can, you can put into that nest, the more um, benefit that you're going to get from those optimizations. So, uh, briefly, I'll just go through the requirements here in the lower uh, right corner. Um, the, these are four conditions that need to be met in order to fuse loops. So, the loops have to be adjacent, meaning that there's nothing in between, there's no intervening code between the two loops. The uh, loops have to iterate the same number of times. The have to be control flow equivalent, so if one loop is going to execute, then the other one will also execute and there can't be any negative distance dependencies between the two loops, meaning the second loop can't be uh, accessing a value that is computed in a future iteration of the first loop. So um, those are the basic requirements. We have um, kind of transformations that you can do to get around all of those requirements, and we've implemented um, parts of those transformations. They're out of tree. Um, so to give you an update on the current status, the recommendation that I got after the talk in, in October was to take the implementation that we had and strip out everything that wasn't absolutely essential to make the patch as small as possible, um, strictly to you know, expedite the review process. So we did that. So what's, basic, what's posted on, on Fabricator right now is the very basics that you need in order to fuse loops. So it doesn't do any, any tricks to try to satisfy the conditions. If the loops are laid out such that all of the conditions are met, then it will fuse them. So essentially it's the, you know, the safety checks are there and the mechanics are there to do the fusion itself. Uh, so that patch has been approved. It was approved a couple weeks ago, but there's still a few comments from one of the reviewers uh, that I'm trying to work out with them to make sure that they're okay with it, at which point it will be, we can commit it, and then we will have a, a basic loop fusion pass. Uh, the pass has not been added to the pass manager because I'm sure that is going to end in, in some very vigorous debate in terms of where this should be placed, um, but it will be there and available to, to test for you to, to, you know, to play with. Then once that patch lands, we've got several other improvements that we've been working on to try and extend it to make it more aggressive. So the, the three things that we're um, looking at doing right now that we have patches for, first is we'd like to, to change Fusion to only work on rotated loops. And I'm gonna go through the details of, of what a rotated loop is and why we wanna do that in a minute. But we wanna focus on rotated loops. We want to 
there's a, a certain situation that arises in terms of guarded loops once you've rotated them that I'm going to walk through in the next few slides. And then the other improvement that we've got uh, waiting to get posted is merging of latch blocks, which is basically uh, an extension to the way that, of the mechanics, that, the way that we're actually fusing the loops. And uh, we're doing it to enable additional fusion opportunities. So I'm going to go through these next three points in, in a little bit more detail. So first of all, loop rotation is a, a pass that runs and it essentially it converts uh, loops into a canonical do while style loop. So you have, uh, uh, you have, if you have this loop here uh, on the left, which is by default what you would get from this example code on the right, if you rotate the loop, it will create a loop that you see here on the right. So you've got the entry block, then you've got the body, you've got the latch at the bottom, which does the comparison, and then it either branches back up to the body or it goes to the, to the exit block. So we wanted to move the, uh, all of the, the loops that we consider for fusion into rotated loops because it makes the implementation of fusion easier. Um, essentially, the canonicalization, especially with respect to the latch and the exiting blocks of the loop, Having those be the same means that we can, we can get rid of a, a bunch of the different conditions that we need to deal with when we're actually fusing the two loops. So um, I think I would, I mean, I personally would like to, to see, you know, rotated loops be part of the canonical form for, for loops that we deal with in, in LLVM. So this is just, uh, like I said, a quick overview of loop rotation. It was added quite a while ago. There's a link to the original patch in the reviews if anybody's interested. So one of the things that we found once we started rotating loops is this concept of a guarded loop. That's what I'm calling it. I don't know if, the, if there's a different term that the, that's used inside LLVM. But <clears throat> excuse me. essentially what happens is when the loop rotation happens, because it's converting it into a do loop, it needs to add a check or a guard to make sure that the loop should execute at least one iteration. So it will end up creating um, this style of a loop where you have this guard up top that uh, basically checks to make sure that the loop body should execute at least once before it goes into the pre-header. And then it's also creating this extra block down here, um, which in the previous compil compiler that I worked in, we called that the epilogue, the loop epilogue. So it's a block that executes after the loop body only once that you can use if you need to, you know, sync instructions outside of a loop. You can put it in the loop epilogue. It's then guarded by the loop guard, so you're guaranteed that it will only execute once. Now, this structure, this guarded loop structure, um, changes things for fusion. And I'm going to show that in this next slide. So here we have uh, two, a pair of loops, two loops that um, we would like to be able to fuse. This is the uh, structure that it looks like by default and then after you've rotated the loops you see this structure here where you have a guard that oh, sorry you have a guard that protects the the, the body of the first loop and then you have this guard here that protects the body of the second loop now the way we've implemented fusion is we've been using the preheaders as the check to see whether a loop it, it our control flow equivalent so we basically check the, the dominator and post-dominator trees for the two pre-headers, and if they're control flow equivalent, then um, we can fuse them. In this case, because the pre-headers are actually under the loop guard, they'll never be control flow equivalent, and so we will not be able to fuse them. So we need to make some adjustments in fusion um, to deal with these guards that are, that are being added. And then the other complication here is the epilogue block that gets added. Um, one of the second conditions for fusion is that the loops have to be adjacent, which means as soon as you get out of the first loop, you go immediately into the second loop. And the presence of this gar or this epilogue block um, breaks the adjacency check as well. So we need to deal with, with this block. Um, so just to kind of summarize uh, what I just said in terms of loop rotation, uh, ideally, for fusion, we'd focus on rotated loops only. However, the loop rotation adds some complications because it's, it's sometimes inserting these guard blocks, but not always inserting them. Um, the specific case that I, that I showed earlier, if, if the compiler is able to prove that 
the loop is always going to execute at least once, then it, then it removes the guard. So we've got this kind of difference in representation of the loops as a result of, of loop rotation. And then there's this other complication with the loop epilogue that, that gets added as well. Now, we can run Simplify CFG after we rotate the loops and it will get rid of the epilogue block if, because it's, it's usually empty and all the examples that we've seen, it, it's always been empty. So we can get rid of that with Simplify CFG, but Simplify CFG is not able to clean up the guard because it can't prove one way or the other whether, uh, whether the loop body is going to execute. So in terms of fusion, there's kind of two possible um, directions we can go. First, we can make the guard block part of the canonical structure of a loop and either force loop rotate or loop simplify to always add a guard block. And if there isn't one, we can always add a trivial guard, which would just be like an, an if one, then you know, execute the loop. And the advantage there is that gives us, like I said, the canonical form. So we can, we can always guarantee whenever we're doing either fusion or any other type of loop optimization, we can always guarantee the presence of both this guard block and the epilogue. Um, now, the, other, the flip side to that is we can just deal with this in fusion and it's, it's fairly easy to check. We've done those checks now in, in, a, in a patch that we have. If the guard block's there, then we use it. If the guard block's not there, then we, then we just use the pre-headers. So um, one of the things that I'd like feedback on and that I'll be posting to the dev list soon is this idea of, of making the guard block part of the canonical structure for a loop uh, because it does affect the way we, the way we um, deal with it in Fusion. So again, if anybody has comments or feedback one way or the other, I'd very much like to hear. <laughs> Um, the second improvement that we've got uh, ready to post is this idea of merging the latches. So I said uh, at the beginning, the, uh, the first patch that we did for, for basic loop fusion does the absolute minimum amount necessary to fuse the loops. And so what it does during the actual fusion, the mechanics of fusing two loops, is it doesn't move things around and merge blocks. All it does is it just relinks the blocks up in the control flow graph. And then we, we wait for a subsequent pass of, of probably simplify CFG to, to clean things up. So what we will end up with, if, if you look at this example here on the, on the right, um, we've got a pair of loop nests. And once we fuse it with the existing, um, the existing basic loop fusion, we end up with the latch block from the first loop is now showing up as intervening code between uh, the inner loops. So the inner loops are no longer adjacent, and so we're preventing ourselves from fusing the innermost loop in these, these two level nests, where what we'd really like to do is fuse the outer loops and then fuse the inner loops, so we just have a, have a single two level loop nest. So uh, the next extension that we've got is to actually merge the latch blocks. So we do the analysis to make sure that it's safe to move the code and the latch blocks around, and then we just create a single latch block at the end of the fused loop. Um, so you see this block here is no longer here. It's, this code has essentially been moved down into here, and now the pre-header for the inner loop is uh, a complete, sorry, this block here is adjacent to the pre-header for the inner loop, and we're able to fuse the two loops to create this kind of a structure. Um, so we did this, uh, we implemented it, when we first implemented it, we, we did it only on rotated loops because again, um, it, it really simplifies the, the mechanics of doing the actual fusion if we only have to deal with rotated loops. Uh, and then, then we, as we started running through more examples, we started realizing that, you know, this issue with the, the guard blocks that are being introduced. So. So these are the kind of the next two patches that we have ready to go for fusion once the basic fusion lands. And then I'll talk about a little bit at the end in terms of you know, the, the next things that we're, that we're looking at for fusion. So we have just uh, some static results, counters that we collected from spec 2017 on the number of loops that are being fused. Uh, the, we did performance analysis last fall and there's no difference in performance, either positive or negative, as a result of doing these fusions. 
Um, same applies here. There's not really any difference in, in performance as a result of the fusions, although we are seeing, you know, a slight increase for a lot of benchmarks in the number of loops fused by the combination of merging the latches and uh, handling the, these guard blocks properly. So this kind of, this kind of uh, illustrates that what I was saying earlier in terms of how we handle the guard blocks, we can deal with it in fusion, but um, I personally think it's a, a little bit more robust solution if we were to, to make the guards part of the, the canonical form for the loops. Okay, so now we're gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about loop distribution. So loop distribution is essentially the opposite of loop fusion. We are taking a loop or a loop nest and we want to distribute it out into multiple loops, two or more loops. Um, you do this for a number of reasons. Again, you can, you can classify them into two main categories, one's for performance and one's for enabling other optimizations. So performance, um, lots of things. There's data reuse, parallelism, um, improving your bandwidth. Then, um, and it's similar for the a, um, enabling other optimizations where um, you can distribute out, you know, loop carry dependencies, for instance, and that's going to enable you to vectorize your loops. Or you can, in this specific example here, we have an imperfect loop nest where we're, you know, initializing an array and then using it in the inner loops, but we can distribute it out so the initialization is done in one loop and then the second loop nest is now a perfect nest. And then a lot of loop optimizations work a lot better on perfect nests than imperfect nests. So, so in this case, one of our motivations for loop distribution is to enable other optimizations, but not just vectorization. This is gonna enable things like loop interchange and loop unroll and jam, some of those, some of those types of optimizations. So there is an implementation of loop distribution in LLVM right now. Um, it provides the ability to distribute innermost loops only. Um, it appears as though from reading the comments and reading the code, it was designed almost entirely for loop vectorization to create, vector, or to create opportunities for loop vectorization. Uh, it uses a lot of the same analysis that vectorization uses, and it only works on, on innermost loops. And in fact, one of the first things it does when it gets in there is it, is it runs the analysis for vectorization and it says, is this loop vectorizable? And if it is, then it just immediately exits. It doesn't even try to do anything else. So um, as I said, it's in there, it's in the past pipeline, but it's not enabled by default. So in addition to enabling it by default, we wanna try to make it more general than that. So it considers things other than um, vectorization. So we're working on developing some heuristics that are gonna be able to guide the loop distribution. Um, we're modeling those on the heuristics that we use in the Excel compilers. So, so the, other, the other teams that I work with are work for IBM um, for their proprietary compilers and it has a very uh, strong loop distribution um, optimization that it uses. And so we're trying to take some of that, that technology that, that's used in Excel and bring it over into LLVM. So there's kind of two key um, data structures that are needed to do this um, that we use in, in Excel that aren't available right now in LLVM. One of them is a data dependence graph, and then the other one is what I'm calling an affinity graph. So data dependence graph, is quickly, is a directed multigraph, basically the nodes, it, in the graph represent statements or group of, groups of statements, and the edges represent data dependencies between, between the nodes. Um, we have the ability to annotate the edges you know, with attributes that describe the, what type of data dependence it is and the distance and, depend, or di distance and direction vectors. So to give you an example, as I said earlier, this is a uh, work in progress that we're, we're currently working on. Um, but just to give you an idea, so this is again a rotated loop, uh, the CFG for a rotated loop for this example up here on the right. The initial DDG that we would create is this, so every node is a separate statement. And then the edges here are the results that we get from the dependence analysis that tell us you know, which uh, statements are dependent on which. And then we've got a simplification pass that goes through the graph and, and collapses nodes that need to be together into a single node. So we've got a, you know, a more condensed version of the, of the DDG that, that allows you to, to see the dependencies um, between statements in a loop and, and reason about them. 
So this is, again, I said work in progress. Um, Barty is working on this and I'm, he's hoping to have some patches available to be posted in the next, in the next little while. And this, I mean, I think we use a data dependence graph in Excel all over the place. So this isn't something that's unique to loop distribution. It's, it's a very useful um, structure to have uh, it just in general when you're doing loop optimizations. Now, the next thing is an affinity graph. So um, what this is, is uh, again, it's a, it's a undirected weighted graph um, that we use to basically represent affinity between these, these uh, nodes. So the nodes are essentially strongly connected components from the data dependence graph. So we go through the data dependence graph and create and find all of the strongly connected components. That those are essentially the statements that need to stay together because they have dependencies between them. So we create the, the nodes. Uh, the nodes also have attributes or characteristics about them. So we do some um, kind of very coarse approximations for things like register pressure, um, other, other you know, backend specific um, information that might be relevant to how, the, how many functional units it uses, whatnot, like this will be very extensible. And then um, the edges represent an affinity between them, or basically a reason that you would want to keep these two statements together, or sorry, these two, these two nodes together. So then we can use this to do loop distribution by essentially walking the graph and uh, greedily and um, trying to put nodes together based on the edge weights between them, as long as combining the two nodes don't exceed some thresholds that we have for the machine model that we, that we are trying to maintain. So if you have you know, high register pressure in, both, in, both, uh, in two nodes that are connected with an edge, you probably wouldn't want to put them together because the resulting register pressure will be even, you know, even greater. So that's the um, kind of the direction that we're going. Um, this is, like I said, this is very early on um, in, the, in the process, so we would certainly welcome feedback if anybody has feedback uh, about this approach. Um, okay, and then kind of the last thing that I wanted to mention, uh, we talked about this a bit in the fall as well, is where to put these different optimizations in the pipeline and how they can interact with each other. So I've mentioned before that you know, both of these, um, both loop fusion and loop distribution have the ability to create opportunities for other optimizations as well as make decisions about performance. So in Excel's compiler, the, the approach that they use is to fuse early and they fuse greedily. They don't take into account any, any heuristics for whether loops should be fused. They, they fuse greedily, they create large loop nests and then they go through the loop optimizations, and then at the end they try to distribute, taking into account all of these different um, conditions. Um, I presented that at uh, in the fall, and I got some feedback saying, you know, that may not be the one the way we want to go for for LLVM because a lot of the passes are designed to kind of compute local locally compute their best. Um, decisions and typically don't like to rely on something later on to go and undo them. So that's one of the reasons that we're going down this direction of the affinity graph because we're hoping that we could use the same graph, the same data structure for both fusion and distribution because in a lot of ways the, the conditions for which you would want to fuse and or distribute are similar. So we're hoping that we can use this affinity graph both to drive the heuristics for fusion as well as distribution. So next steps, um, the, again, one thing I'd like to do is converge on a, on a direction in terms of loop rotation and guarded loops because it is gonna change the, the implementation that we have for Fusion and then once we've got that um, decided, uh, we have a couple patches, like I said, that are ready to, to post. Uh, and then we also have additional work that we've been working on basically trying to remove some of the other uh, conditions or restrictions that we have for fusion. So basically making it more aggressive by moving statements around, by peeling loops, um, that sort of thing. And then for the loop distribution, uh, Barty is anxious to post patches and, and try to get his DDG implementation under review. And then we'll probably uh, have some kind of a, of a discussion on the dev list around this affinity graph idea and before we get too much further into it, whether people think it's a good idea or whether we need to kind of adjust course significantly. 
And that's it. That's it. Thank you very much, Kit. Uh, if you have questions, please use the mics or raise your hand and I'll bring a mic to you. So for the, um, the DDG and the affinity graph, is the expectation that they'll just be used in the loop distribution? Or are those going to be analysis that you'll have to like, keep live throughout the whole loop optimization pipeline? Um, I, I think it's specifically for the DDG, I think it makes sense for it to be an analysis because I think there's other loop optimizations that could benefit from it. For the affinity graph, we're trying to do it in a way that we could reuse it. Um, the one that we've, I guess the one that we're going for to, to focus on would be for fusion as well. But if there's other, other um, optimizations that might be able to use it, I think it, it might be good to explore that as well. Okay, so my follow-up question then is, um, how complicated do you think it will be to update the analysis after, you know, so you do, you do like fusion, do a bunch of end passes that you don't know about, and then distribution. You're gonna have to like update those analysis or recalculate them. Like, have you got a kind of handle on how costly it will be to update? Uh, no, <laughs> in a word. Uh, we will need to keep them up to date. And, and I mean, there are other passes that let you do this. For instance, the dominator trees and post on, like, so we just haven't looked at the mechanics of doing that. Um, but you whether, think it's possible though? Like, uh, like intuitively, tree, yes. Yeah. yeah, intuitively, yes. I think it. I think it's possible. Yes. Okay. Uh, cool. Thanks. Yeah. But that's. I mean, I haven't tried it. But yeah. Yeah. Nice talk. Thanks. Uh, so after you do the fusion, uh, have you considered, uh, or do you have enough information to do uh, to optimize away the temporary, for example, uh, and or maybe do uh, store to load uh, forwarding over there, which is often possible uh, once you do uh, fusion in the case of producer to consumer. And so have you considered that? So let me give you just more benefits with the fusion. Which temporary? Uh, so let's say you have one loopness producing uh, an array and then another one using that. So when you fuse, uh, one of the nice benefits that you may get is that you can optimize away right. uh, the temporary and then you can just forward the uh, store to the load and if there are no more users and you have if you have all the aliasing information and things like that, you can just optimize. Right. It. Yeah. So we haven't really looked at the you know the opportunities that are going to be unlocked as a result of of fusion. Is sorry, I should rephrase. In LLVM, we haven't done that. So we've gone through a lot of those exercises in Excel. So we you know we certainly know examples where fusion is going to un, in, unlock other other uh, opportunities. Um, but I, we haven't done a kind of a rigorous analysis in terms of whether we're getting those now or whether we need additional passes in LLVM. Did that answer your yes. question? Okay. So uh, as a vectorizer guy, I'm interested in actually having those fusion and distribution happening definitely before the vectorizer to yes. the point that it won't prevent vectorization. So. Yes, <laughs> yes. In fact, that's one of the things I, I, I think it was on one of the slides that we're, we're discussing internally is whether or not we want to run multiple passes of fusion and distribution for various reasons. So we could run them early to do enable and then run them late to, to do more performance. Yeah. Hey kid, nice talk. So uh, because you are now at least planning or thinking in terms of building the DDG and the affinity graph and stuff like that, uh, have you thought of at least doing some kind of a loop tiling? Loop tiling? Yeah. Um, it's, it, we've certainly talked about it, um, but one of the things that we're, we're finding is some of these basic, you know, fusion and distribution, we need to do that first before we can get to some of the more, I don't want to call them advanced, but some of those types of optimizations. So for instance, one of the reasons that we're interested in distribution is because we have examples where we're working on imperfect loop nests. And, and we'd really like to make those perfect. And then once they're perfect, then we can look at, you know, either tiling or interchange or, you know, whatever. Yeah, because all this infrastructure that will be used in any of these will be fairly common. And you're, you're yes. planning to anyway build the DDG and stuff like that. So yes. that can all be reused, actually. Yeah, I think the, the DDG especially, I think it, it would be very useful for, for many other optimizations as well. Okay, thank you. One more question. Uh, thanks for the talk. So, uh, for I'm um, like a following question about DDG. So, first of all, big thanks because uh, uh, we always want a really great dependency analysis. But still, like, how does it compare with the current uh, dependency info? 
So it uses the current dependence analysis to compute the edges. So as we make improvements to the dependence analysis, we can we'll get more refinement in the in the DDG. Oh, so it's just like a wrapper of the current dependence analysis to become like to form a graph. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, so it's a different it's a different representation of the the information that's currently available. Yes. Okay. Thanks. All right. Great. Let's thank you.